A um, little bit of an outline, like I said, we're going to talk about some anatomy and some basics of glaucoma, uh, talk about the different types of glaucoma a little bit, and then question and answer after that. Again, a little bit about me, who I am, so you have maybe some confidence in what I'm telling you. So a little map of the United States. So I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. That is a picture of me from when I was a little kiddo. Um, and I did my undergraduate at UCLA where um, I got to be close to family. It was great. And then I decided to take a huge leap and go all the way to Nashville, Tennessee, where I did medical school at Vanderbilt. Subsequent to that, I did my residency at Emory just down the street in Atlanta and then went a little farther south down to Miami where I did my fellowship in glaucoma, surgical glaucoma at Bascom Palmer. And the plan was always to head all the way back to Los Angeles, join my family, and somehow I got stuck halfway. It's what one of my patients called the promised land here in Texas. And I got to join the best group in the country at Glaucoma Associates of Texas. Uh, we have a, an eighth doctor now who unfortunately is not part of this photo because we haven't been able to take a group photo since COVID started. But we are the largest private practice glaucoma group in the country. Uh, we see more patients than anybody else from a glaucoma standpoint, easily in the state and likely nationwide. And we do research and um, things through our nonprofit. And this was just an amazing opportunity. And I just feel fortunate to be here every day. Um, and very, very fortunate to have you all as, uh, be here with us. So um, I realized when I gave a very similar talk a few years ago, it was actually right after my wedding. And so I shared a couple of pictures so y'all can meet my beautiful wife. Um, but since that time, Morris has changed in my personal life and we welcomed a new member to our family. Uh, this is Amelia, my little daughter. She's five months old. Um, and that picture on the far right is her in the snow just uh, last week. She was all smiles and giggles uh, for about the first six seconds until the cold and the wetness went right through her little jumper and she was not happy anymore. So um, she's been a blessing to our life. And so just a little bit about me, who, so you guys get to know me. All my patients, I think, know all sorts of things about me. Um, so I think everybody on this call should as well. All right, so a little bit about eye anatomy, and I'm going to see if I can turn on my pointer here. So y'all should can hopefully see my laser pointer, so that'll be pointing at different things. So this is an external view of the eye. Um, doesn't show much of what we deal with on a daily basis as far as eyelids and you know the lacrimal glands. I do want to discuss this for just one moment. Oftentimes when we're talking about the drainage system of the eye, and I kind of start to explain that, patients immediately will start saying, oh yeah, I've been having a lot of tearing of the eye. And that is a very different drainage system than what we're gonna be talking about in a moment. But the drainage system people are usually referring to is the tearing system on the eye. And so up here is the lacrimal gland. That's where tears are created. They're secreted onto the surface of the eye. And every time you blink, those tears get moved around and ultimately end up in the corner of the eye closest to the nose. The nose would be over here. And that's where they enter these two little tubes and ultimately end up into the back of your nose. And that's where you swallow your tears. And so that's why when you cry, you get a stuffy nose and you feel like your throat's full. It's all because of tearing on the surface, completely unrelated to the, um, the drainage system we talk about from a glaucoma standpoint. And we're gonna be talking about it in the next couple of slides. The pupil refers to the dark center part of the eye. The iris is the, um, the, the pigmented, the beautiful part of the eye. And so the pupil is actually just a hole in the iris. That's all the pupil is, it's just an emptiness. It's not actually something, it's a lack of something. Um, and so we're gonna go on to our next slide. So if we were to take away all those bony landmarks and all the skin and everything, we'd be looking at directly at the eyeball and the six various muscles that control it. These come into play from a glaucoma standpoint when we're doing surgeries and we're working in and near the eye muscles. And one of the things that unfortunately can happen with some patients who have some glaucoma surgeries is that they end up with double vision. And that's because you were usually working up in this outer quadrant of the eye. And we're very close to this, what's called the superior rectus muscle and then lateral rectus muscle. And when you mess with those a little bit, it can make them not work 100% normal subsequently. And as a result, somebody can end up with double vision if both eyes are not moving together normally. But in general, as I, doctor, or as a glaucoma specialist, we're staying away from the eye muscles, not something we want to have anything to do with. If we were to take the eye and cut it in half, this is what it would look like. So the front part of the eye would be here. The back part of the eye would be here. I always liken the eye to a camera. It essentially works the same as a camera, has a lot of the same parts as a camera, and its job is to take a photograph. 
But after you take a photograph, you don't see the photograph until you print it. We're not talking about the fancy digital cameras that we have nowadays where you get instant gratification, but you need to print the picture in order to see it. And printing does not happen in the eye, but happens in the brain. And so somehow you need to get the information from the eye to the brain. And the way you do that is through something called the optic nerve, which is at the back part of the eye. The optic nerve is basically a cable made up of 1.2 million little wires that gather all the information from the eye, shuttle it to the brain, and that's where the printing happens. I had a patient actually today, I was given this whole talk to, and as soon as I said, you know, 1.2 million nerves, he said, that's why you can't do an eye transplant. I said, that's exactly right. That's exactly why when patients talk about why can't we do eye transplants, it's because this optic nerve is so incredibly complex. The optic nerve, again, over a million wires, and if those become damaged or cut and you need to repair them, imagine trying to put one million wires back together and they're not color coded in any sort of way. Not to mention those wires all go to different places in the brain. They don't all go to the same location. So before we can ever do an eye transplant, ultimately we need to figure out how to make those wires work together from brain to eye, which is such a complex thing. And unfortunately, it is this nerve that becomes damaged in patients with glaucoma. Patients with glaucoma will have high pressure inside the eye that pushes on this nerve, damages it slowly, and can ultimately lead to vision loss and blindness if this goes uncontrolled. Any questions so far? I would love for you all to interrupt me as we go. You can unmute. Uh, un I know that Jennifer kind of gave some ways to ask questions, so she'll call them out to me if you have them, but you can also unmute your speaker. I'm happy to answer any questions as we're going along if some of this does not make sense. So now a little bit more detailed about the glaucoma. So we talked about glaucoma is a high pressure problem in general, although not always, and we'll get to that in a little while, but in general, it's a pressure problem inside the eye that damages the optic nerve. And we talk about two major types of glaucoma, open angle and closed angle. But I wanna talk a little bit about the drainage system of the eye inside the eye. So we talked about the tearing system on the surface of the eye. Now we're gonna be talking about the drainage system inside the eye. And earlier I talked about the eye acting like a camera, but it also acts like a very simple plumbing problem and an overcrowded sink or a, a clogged sink. So there's constantly fluid being made inside the eye and there's a faucet that brings that fluid and nutrients into the eye and that's over here. And that's behind the iris, behind the colored part of the eye. And that fluid flows through the pupil and then gets to the front part of the eye where it ultimately drains out through a drainage system. And there is some sort of imbalance there that ultimately leads to glaucoma and there being elevated pressure. The drainage system of the eye, again, what I'm highlighting with my red arrow, we as glaucoma doctors and as ophthalmologists, we call that the angle. It's just kind of a colloquial term we use, but it refers to the angle that is forming between the cornea, the front part of the eye, and the iris. So this angle here is what we refer to as just uh, blanket the angle, and that is the drainage system of the eye. And so when you hear about open angle glaucoma or closed angle glaucoma, it refers to whether this angle, this drainage system is visibly open to us on exam or whether it is closed off. And that's what that next slide is gonna show is a picture of open angle glaucoma and closed angle. So on the left side, we have what's called open angle. There is space or an opening to reach to the drainage system. So again, fluid is made back behind the iris. It travels up and through the pupil and then out towards the drainage system. And you can see those little blue arrows, which would represent the fluid of the eye, are able to get to the drainage system quite easily because it's an open angle. Closed angle is on the opposite side where there's very little space in that angle. Again, where it's highlighted in purple, but that angle is closed off the iris has abutting the cornea, there's no space there, and that's called closed angle glaucoma. There's two major types like we talked about, the open angle and the closed angle, but within each of those there's probably another half dozen or more types of glaucoma, things called pigmentary glaucoma or pseudoexfoliation glaucoma. There's glaucoma related to people being on certain medications like steroids. There's glaucoma related to trauma. And some of those can fall into the open angle category and some can fall into the closed angle category. But in the end, it doesn't matter which one you have because the treatment is all the same. 
the treatment is all about lowering the eye pressure, which we can do with medications, which we can do with lasers, which we can do with surgery. And the techniques that we might use might be a little bit different between a closed angle glaucoma patient and an open angle glaucoma patient. But ultimately, the treatment is the same, which is to lower the pressure in the eye to, again, prevent the optic nerve damage, which will ultimately cause vision loss and blindness if it goes uncontrolled. So I'm going to pause there because this is really the majority of what I wanted to cover. I don't really want to hear myself speak too much. Um, I would love to answer any questions about the anatomy and things like that. And then if not, we'll start moving on to your questions, the things that you guys are interested in. And if we don't have any volunteers, I'll pull up some, um, some questions that we had submitted to us in advance. Jennifer, are they able to unmute and ask questions? They should be able to. Mike, can you try that please for me? To unmute. Yeah, it works fine. It's just in the bottom left corner of the screen. Okay. Yeah, so in the bottom left corner, if you'd like to unmute and ask any questions while I pull up the list of questions that we have. Yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted, can anybody hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, doctor, I, I, you've worked with me a couple of times with Dr. Feldman wasn't there, this is Ed's Stuart. Hey, Ed, how are you? All right, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Thanks for joining. Yeah, uh, always a pleasure. Uh, so, uh, I missed the first few minutes, but just wondering, yeah, any advances? I mean, this this glaucoma thing, I'm, I'm, I'm telling my kids to get, get checked all the time as well, but uh, so once the damage is done, uh, is your, your goose cooked when, you know, I, I, I'm worried, you know, this left eye is really challenging. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So, unfortunately, yeah, that kind of goes back to one of the things I mentioned earlier. Once damage happens from glaucoma, there's no way to reverse that damage. Glaucoma is very much of a proactive disease. You have got to stay on top of it as soon as it's diagnosed. Because again, once that damage happens to the nerve, there's no way to, to regenerate it. There's a ton of research that's going on in it, some of which is funded by this organization, but all sorts of organizations around the country and around the world that are trying to figure out how can we either regenerate that optic nerve using stem cells or things of the sort? Right. How can we grow new cells? But Ed, you know, get to your question. Once that damage okay. is done, you can't undo it because it is just such an incredibly complex mechanism to regrow the nerves, which we can't do yet. But even if we could regrow them, we got to somehow give them an address to, to go to from the eye to the brain yeah. and they need a very specific address. You can't just say, hey guys, go to Dallas. You gotta tell them, hey, you need to go to 10740 North Central Expressway, Suite 3. I mean, you gotta give very, very specific directions to each one of those little nerves that are being damaged. And again, if you're thinking about 1.2 million of those nerves needing addresses and we have no way to tell them where to go, hence the complexity and why we're not able to regenerate the nerves and get them to go to the right places. Now, I am a firm believer that this will be figured out one day, and we're hoping that some of the research our organization is doing is going to help lead to that, but it is certainly not in prime time. There's nothing even remotely close in 2020, 2021 that replaces regular eye exam, medication, mm -hmm. surgeries that we're doing that are acting on the preventative side, because unfortunately, again, we don't have anything on the back end. Anything even abroad? I mean, um, you know, I know you got to wait for FDA approval and all that good stuff. I mean, Europe doing anything? I mean, for example, cross-linking wasn't being used for cornea. They were using Intac for a long time. And then right. that got uh, So, you know, do I need to fly to Siberia or wherever? <laughs> 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 so I'm glad you asked that question because it's a really important one. So we are, again, involved in some clinical trials. Trials. We were involved in one um, over the last 24 months or so. That trial has ended. It was us partnering with Stanford as far as um, looking at some growth factors to try to help strengthen the optic nerve. Mm -hmm. There's actually some very reassuring information that came out of that. There's nothing prime time about that. We're hoping that there's going to be a second stage and third stage to that study. There's nothing anywhere in the world that is being done that I know of that it is worth either paying money for or being involved in clinical trials, absolutely, but that you shouldn't be paying for anything, these things. And the reason it's such an important question is because there are numerous centers, most of which are outside the United States, although there are some shady places in the United States as well. Most of them are located 
in China, in Russia, in Brazil, some of the Eastern European countries that are reporting that, oh, if you come to me, we're going to inject stem cells into your spinal canal, we'll inject them into your eye. By the way, it costs about $80,000 or $50,000, um, and it's going to bring back your vision. We've had people do stuff like that. I had a patient um, who I haven't seen in quite some time. He was actually a patient of one of my partners who had gone down to Mexico and was trying to do some of these things. There's always going to be somebody trying to take advantage of right. somebody who's in yeah. and so that's the unfortunate situation but the reality right now so i tell my patients if it's not being done by a major um, clinic or a major academic institution in the united states it is probably not a good idea now the fda is a little bit slower and more cautious in the united states compared to some of its counterparts in europe in australia and other places around the world but i'm okay with that little bit of uh, pause before we start doing something invasive to somebody and one of the final questions you mentioned, you, got, you know, so you just got to really monitor this. So me coming in and seeing you guys every three months, that's really what you got to do. I mean, last check, so last month I went to Dr. Sully for something with the red man. And you know, so my pressure is 10 and 10. I don't want to wake up one morning and it's, uh, you know, 39. And it, I mean, that won't happen overnight. Well, as long as I'm doing my drops and all that stuff. In general, the, the generic answer, Ed, is no, that doesn't happen for most people. Can it happen? Absolutely, but it's not usually overnight. It usually tends to be over several weeks or even over a couple of months. Mm -hmm. The usual form of glaucoma is that the pressure will slowly rise, right? We'll see somebody who's doing pretty well, normal pressures, whether on medications or not, and then maybe over time, we see that their pressure has gone from 15 to 18 to 23 to 27. That's usually how it happens. Okay. That being said, that is not always the case. There are people and, and I have a handful of these patients in my clinic and all doctors do that they almost haunt you in a way because they were stable for so, 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 so long. And then they show up one day and like you said, their pressure went from being 15 to 45. And wow. it seems like it's overnight, but it, it happened sometime during that three month period. And why? No idea. I mean, I, I, there's a physician that I take care of who is a great, great guy. He had been seeing his usual op. Uh, optometrist annually for glasses, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. In fact, the pressure had been doing fine for years and then went in one day and the pressure was nearly 60. Wow. And it had happened sometime over that intervening year and he had lost probably about 80 to 90% of his vision in that last year. That is not the norm. And he was doing everything right. And he's still a practicing physician and he does fine, even though he's lost so much vision. But, you know, we got on top of it right right away, got him on some medications, ultimately needed surgery within a couple of weeks of my meeting him, but that's what it took to get him under control. But that is not the norm. And I mean, he's one example. I have a young girl who was 14 when I first saw her and she was the same thing. A year before I had been told, hey, your pressures are a little bit high, but nothing to be worried about. Her optometrist said, don't worry about it. Come on back in a year. When she went back in a year, her pressure was over 50 in both eyes and she's legally blind in both eyes. So wow. that's the uncommon side of glaucoma that unfortunately happens but that's why we keep monitoring people i mean again just had a discussion with a guy that he can't keep missing his appointments he's a young african-american gentleman and for some reason got a very aggressive form of glaucoma and it just ain't clicking up here yet that it's a problem and he's losing vision and I don't want him to be one of those people who shows up five years from now and has lost a tremendous amount of vision and then there's nothing I can do. And I hope there's something I could do in five years, but I'm only willing to talk about what I can do now, not what I might be able to do in five years. Yeah. The physician you're treating, you know, he's still practicing, so he has that one good eye. So, I mean, I'm, I'm driving right now, but I, I'm leaning heavily on one eye. So you can still have a functional life, I guess, with You that. can have a 100 percent, well, I'll say 99% normal life with one good eye. I mean, you could do just about anything in this world. There's a couple of professions you probably cannot do. You can't be a pilot or a commercial pilot. But short of that, you could do just about anything with one eye. And so I kind of always try to give that encouragement and hope to people that you can live a normal life with one eye. Okay. Thanks, Ed. I'm going to go uh, one question that we got through our chat. Uh, it says, physically, how do eye drops reduce pressure? It's uh, it's easier to visualize surgical relief. And Steve asked that question. So that's a great question. There are several ways that eye drops can help lower pressure. So I'm going to go back if uh, I think my, my screen is still shared, correct? 
Y'all still see my shared screen? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I'm going to keep it on this um, on this sheet right here. The majority of medications that we have had for going on 30, 40 years have worked on, on the faucet part of glaucoma. That's, again, the area of the eye that is creating fluid and pumping it into the eye as well as nutrients. And so most of the eye drops that we've had up until this point, Steve, have essentially tried to shut off that faucet, to turn it down, so not as much fluid is getting into the eye. So again, mm -hmm. looking at the eye like a sink, if you have an overflowing sink, you can either turn down the faucet, and hopefully it won't overflow as much, and that'll give the drain a, trans a chance to work. And again, that's what most of our medications have done for quite some time. About... Um, 20 years ago, 24 years ago, it could be 25 years ago, I guess, actually, to be exact, the first medication came out that worked somewhat on the, the drainage system of the eye. There's kind of two drain, I don't want to get into the details, but there's two kind of drainage systems of the eye. There's a major one and a minor one, and this one worked on the minor one, but was very, very, very effective to get the drainage system of the eye to work better. About three years ago, we had our first new medication in glaucoma in over 20 years, and that one specifically targeted the major drainage system of the eye. And so, um, Steve, to your question, it's absolutely understandable why surgery seems like a much easier thing to understand. Fluids building up in the eye, we create a way for fluid to get out of the eye. But the medications are doing very similar things, but on a microscopic level. They're either turning down the faucet in the eye, and like I said, that's what the majority of our medications do, or they're working on the drainage system of the eye, opening it up, you can think of. I describe it to patients as like roto rootering the drain. That's what we do surgically, but that's basically what these medications are. They're kind of like liquid plumber or draino for the eye. They're opening up that drainage system so more fluid can get out of the eye. I'm gonna unshare my screen so you guys can look at me in case I'm doing some sort of... All right, I think y'all can see me again, hopefully. Any other questions or from our live studio audience. Looks like Dixon has a question. There, I needed to unmute. There you go. Um, when I was, shortly after I was first diagnosed, I had a iridotomy, I believe I'm saying that right. Mm -hmm. And that supposedly would prevent, you know, well, you can tell me, because my question really is, do you use that very often. Uh, I've tried to get into a couple of studies that were being done on glaucoma and rejected because I've had this iridotomy. Is that the plumber rotor rooter you're talking about? Not quite, but let me explain what an iridotomy is. So if it's okay, I'm going to reshare my screen again. So I had a good question. Uh, uh, the iridotomy is to deal with patients with closed angle glaucoma or a narrow angle glaucoma. Narrow angle and closed angle, those terms are used a little bit interchangeably. They're technically different things, but for the most part, they're, from, for our discussion, they'll be the same. A narrow angle, again, not very much space to get into the drainage system. You can see that the, uh, sorry, do you see that? No, yeah, sorry, I was on the wrong screen. You can see that, again, this narrowing of the drainage system right here, that is, um, that's a problem, right? So fluid can't get to the drain. These little blue arrows are trying to make their way to get to the drain, but it's getting a U-turn because it can't get out. And again, that's because the fluid dynamics of the eye have been affected by that drainage system. You can see the iris, which is the red, um, the red structure here is kind of bowed upwards. And so what an iridotomy does, the term iridotomy means a hole in the iris. That's literally what we're doing. We're creating a very small hole in the iris, usually out in the peripheral part of the iris, so that the little blue arrows can sneak their way and they don't have to make this long path like they're making on this side, going all the way through the pupil. What they'll do is to take a shortcut and go through the iris and straight to the drainage system. We're kind of giving them a shortcut to get to the drainage system. The reason that you've been denied from being in studies is because the vast majority of patients that they include in most studies is for open angle glaucoma, not closed angle glaucoma. And so having had laser iridotomies, that means that you at some point had either a narrow drainage system or a closed drainage system. And so they don't want you to be in the studies. Just like any other study, clinical studies, whether it's for glaucoma or for COVID, you in general try to find healthy, in, as healthy as possible, except for the one thing that you're looking at. And so they want a very healthy eye, no other forms of glaucoma, no other weird things. And because open angle glaucoma 
standpoint is by far and away the vast majority in the United States, those are the patients that they're going to study. The nice thing is that once things are approved for open angle patients, we use them in, um, in glaucoma patients as well with closed angle or any other form of glaucoma. But that is why that you've probably been denied being in most studies. Does that answer the question about what the iridotomy is? But no, that did not target your drainage system directly. It's just trying to recreate normal fluid flow within the eye so that, um, so that your, in theory, your drainage system opens up and more fluid is able to leave the eye. Uh, yes, and Tina is right. Yes, you're right. I know for some reason, I guess your micro, microphone's not working, but yes, you're exactly right. Drops better enable drainage. Some of them enable better drainage and some of them enable uh, decreased fluid inflow into the eye. And those are kind of the two major ways that the glaucoma medications are working. Any other live questions? These are great. great. These are really great questions. Audrey has a question. Audrey, where are you at, girl? Hi. I just saw you. <laughs> I'm right up here at the top, Doc. I just left your office, right? Yeah, I know, just a few minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, I'm still, uh, my eyes are still a little dilated. <laughs> yes, they will be for another few hours. <laughs> you know, my question is, I've been with you for now about five years. And, uh, one of the questions that you know is posed to me a lot is how how does your blood pressure play into your eye pressure love it good question because this is a very common misconception about glaucoma is that patients will show up they have high eye pressure they say but doc my blood pressure is great why is this affecting that in any way and it's because the two have nothing to do with each other in any sort of reliable way. Eye pressure is eye pressure, uh, blood pressure is blood pressure. Now, high blood pressure can significantly affect the eye. Saw a lady yesterday who has dramatic vision loss from high blood pressure related eye problems, but completely unrelated to her glaucoma. In fact, she doesn't have glaucoma. They sent her to me because they thought she did, but her eye problems are a result of her high blood pressure affecting her retina. So the back part of the eye, let me see if I can, again, share my screen one more time. And I will show you, okay, so, so the retina is, and you all see my shared screen, correct? Yeah, hopefully. Okay, so the, um, the retina is, is the back wall of the eye. It lines the inside of the eye like wallpaper and it acts like the film in a camera. And many of the diseases that we're all familiar with affect the retina. So retinal detachments, as the name would imply, macular degeneration is a problem of the retina. Diabetic eye disease is a problem of the retina. High blood pressure eye disease is a problem of the retina. So the vast majority of the eye diseases that we think about are related to the retina. But again, the blood pressure and eye pressure are completely unrelated. You certainly want to keep both under control, but there's no reliable way that we know of to correlate high blood pressure with high eye pressure. Now, it doesn't mean that high blood pressure is not actually a probably very small risk factor for developing glaucoma, but it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's not 10 points high in your blood pressure equals one point high in your eye pressure. Those two are unrelated. Just like diabetes is a small risk factor for um, developing glaucoma, it's not because the blood sugar is making the eye pressure go up in a direct way. There's some underlying mechanism that we don't know of that is causing patients with high blood pressure or, or, or uh, diabetes, excuse me, to have a higher risk of developing glaucoma. Audrey, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it did. And I just had a second part to that question, to my question. Please. Uh, I've got a neighbor, although she's 91, she, uh, <laughs> she knows that I've had glaucoma surgery and cataract surgery. And she's, she's literally blind because she's afraid to have a cataract surgery because she, she told me that it's going to lead to immaculate degeneration. Okay. Can you give some clarification on that? Because I told her, you know, I, I had it five years ago and I, I don't, I'm doing great. 
Yeah, you are doing, you're doing better than you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, your surgery turned out fantastic, fortunately. I'm glad you joined the call in our a, a little promo for me on here. Um, unfortunately, if, if, the, if that's what your neighbor has said, um, she's unfortunately very misinformed. Um, so let's talk about a couple things. Let me share my, oh, I'm still sharing, I think. Okay, so... Um, yeah, that's a, yeah, you were sharing your screen. Okay, so what is a cataract? A cataract is simply another word for saying cloudy lens. So I talked about the eye being like a camera and the one of the major parts of a camera is the lens of a camera. That's what helps get things into focus for you. And that's what the lens does for the eye as well. But the lens doesn't live on the front of your camera. It lives inside your camera, inside the eye. And so I'm highlighting right now the lens inside your eye. And when you're young, that lens is nice and clear and very flexible. It can change its shape to accommodate uh, different visions or uh, needing different visions, so distance, near, et cetera. But as you get older, that lens becomes more cloudy. So it's not clear anymore, but we become more yellow, uh, yellowish in color and brownish in color. Um, so it makes it difficult to see through just physically because it's um, a barrier to light getting into the eye. But in addition, it becomes less flexible and more dense. And that's what we call a cataract. So a cataract is just another word for a cloudy lens. And cataract surgery involves going in there, removing this lens and replacing it with a new artificial lens made out of plastic. Cataract surgery is the most common surgery in the world, the most common surgery in the United States, because just about everybody on planet Earth will need it. One of my mentors said, if you didn't have cataract surgery before you died, it's because you died too young. That's really what it is. Because just about everybody gets cataract surgery these days. Um, cataracts and macular degeneration are completely unrelated. So again, macular degeneration, and I'm gonna share my screen again if I can for this sec. Macular degeneration, affects this central part of the retina. You see it says fovea centralis. That's the middle of the macula and the macula is the middle of the retina. So the macula would be right here. And that's again, the central part of the retina. And it is that that degenerates. It starts to, oh, are you guys seeing me? Sorry, I, I thought I was sharing, I wasn't. Okay, sorry, one more time. This is the fovea right here, the central part of the macula. The macula, again, is a, a, just a part of the retina. The middlemost, most important part of the retina is called the macula. And very common in Caucasian people, um, see it in Asian people as well. Highly uncommon in African-Americans to see it, but it can be seen. In macular generation, that retina just starts to die off quicker than it should in that central region. So glaucoma, I'm gonna kind of do a little simulation on my screen now. So kind of, if you look at the camera, glaucoma causes loss of your peripheral vision. People will talk about having tunnel vision. So they've lost everything in the periphery, but in the middle, they can see perfect. And so glaucoma patient can see have 20-20 vision, but have lost 90% of their vision. Macular degeneration is almost the complete opposite. It affects your central vision first and foremost. So they will have a blind spot in the middle or it start to lose vision in the middle, whereas the periphery will be completely fine. Mm -hmm. Totally unrelated to glaucoma, totally unrelated to cataracts. The only, and I'm not a retina specialist, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, although I think I know what I'm talking about. The only correlation between cataracts and the macular degeneration is gonna be that after cataract surgery, you're able to get more light into the eye. And there is some belief that that extra light and UV light that's getting into the eye can cause some of the damage from macular degeneration. However, especially for your neighbor who's 90 plus, holy moly, they just need to have some, I mean, if truly their vision is from their cataracts and that's how blind they are, those are my favorite cases to do because those are the ones that you can make a world of difference for people. You can truly give back somebody their life, their quality of life by removing their cataract and giving them sight again. I mean, the number one cause of preventable blindness in the world is need for glasses. And just behind that is the need for cataract surgery. And we live in a society in the United States where again, 3 million cataract surgeries are done a year in the United States. And you should be able to get it. Now you live in sub-Saharan Africa and don't have access to medical care. That's a reason, but it almost hurts me to hear that somebody is not getting cataract surgery and could benefit from it. 
Dr. Emanuel, do you see the questions over? I do. I see a whole bunch of questions just came Great. through. This is awesome. Okay. Uh, so let me read those. And if it's okay, I'll just kind of call out your first name at least. Um, so Sharon asked, how long will patients typically stay on the same drugs? Um, <laughs> that is a loaded question. So there is not a clear answer to that question. Most patients respond to most medications, but not all patients respond to all medications. So what I mean by that is that when I start a medication on a patient, they're likely to do pretty well, it's likely to reduce their pressure significantly. And if not one, then maybe two or three or four. And some of y'all may even know people that are on five medications to keep the pressure under control or have been yourselves on five medications. But just like any medication we take, whether it's an eye drop or a pill, unfortunately, the body has a the, the desire to stop making it work. It's just not as effective over time. The fancy word for that is called tachyphylaxis, which is your body getting used to a medication and it being less effective. That doesn't mean it's not effective or it stops being effective completely. It just means that it's not working quite as well. You can imagine that if your body is naive to a medication and you take something, it's taken by shock, by a storm. It doesn't know what to do with it. And so it responds very well to it. But after a while, it kind of just starts to get used to it. So, you know, if somebody's kind of sitting there poking your shoulder all the time, at first, it's, you're feeling it, you're annoyed by it, but after a while, your body just kind of gets used to it and becomes desensitized to it. I can't answer your, answer your question, Jared. I can't tell you how long, but I definitely have patients who have been on a single drop for years and years and years, definitely as long as I've been at this practice, and that's all they've ever needed to control their eye pressure. And then there's people on the other end of the spectrum that we've tried the entire gamut of medications and nothing seems to work very well on them. And oftentimes they need surgery and maybe multiple surgeries to get their pressure under control. So there isn't a one size fits all, which is what makes glaucoma, not just one disease, but a multitude of diseases. Because even though two patients can have the same type of glaucoma, the way their eyes act can be 100% different. And in fact, even the same patient, one eye acts one way and one eye acts a different way. Um, I'm gonna to jump to Anne Marie. So does lifestyle, exercise, diet, et cetera, actually lower eye pressure or is that a just quote best practices? I've always loved this question because, um, you know, I think oftentimes we always want to know what is it that I can do? What can I do to make this better? What can I do in my day-to-day -day life to make my glaucoma go away? And the general answer for you, uh, Anne Marie, is that there isn't, any dietary or lifestyle changes that we know of that directly impact your eye pressure. There are some studies that say yes, and there are some studies that say no. And when that's the case, you gotta kind of just assume it's a bit of a wash. I, in general, tell people that whatever is good for the body is good for the eyes. So take care of your body, eat well, exercise, do all the things that you need to do to take care of your body, and it's good for the eyes as well. But the only things that have proven efficacy, as far as we know, are the medical therapies that we're offering, um, which are, for the most part, eye drops and pills to some degree, but the vast majority of which are eye drops. The follow-up question to this is actually two follow-up questions that I oftentimes get asked. Number one, you know, what about doing yoga? And what about when I want to do Pilates and I'm going to be in a downward dog position or my head is going to be down? I was reading up a little bit about this before I jumped on this call because I had a feeling this would be a topic of conversation. And yes, we know that some of those positions can probably increase your eye pressure. So being in a head down position for a prolonged period of time can be. But I still don't recommend not doing those things. I think that it is so important to be physically active. And so if the thing that you enjoy doing is yoga, then do it because I don't think that those, you know, two or three minutes, several times a week that you're going to be in a, uh, a head down position are going to affect your glaucoma. I think that your overall health is far more important than just your glaucoma, right? We got to treat the whole patient and overall health is, again, top of the list. Eyes, I think, are pretty important, but what's the point of keeping your eyes perfect and keeping your pressure perfect if you end up dying from a heart attack because you're so scared to be physically active? So be physically active, do all the things you enjoy doing. Um, from an eating standpoint, the only thing I always recommend, if you know, the only thing that we know that can affect eye pressure pretty significantly are steroids. So oral steroids, topical creams, nasal 
sprays, injections. So always talk to your glaucoma doctor about those things if you're going to be doing them. Um, and then antihistamines to some degree. That's a little bit kind of a, of a dicier subject, kind of depends on the type of glaucoma. But those are the two things from a medical standpoint that you could be taking unknowingly that might be affecting your eye pressure. All right. Um, oh, one other thing. So the second point that I want to bring up, um, because most of y'all are very polite and probably won't ask this question, is what about marijuana? Where does that fit into my regimen? I know all of you guys are waiting to light up a joint right after this call to help your glaucoma. You know, <laughs> well, not <laughs> it, I don't know. Ed is starting to chime in. I know Ed's already lighting up right now, probably. What's going on there, Ed? No, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> so marijuana and actually THC, one of the uh, ingredients within marijuana, has been shown to lower eye pressure. That is true. However, the amount that you need to smoke or eat or consume in one form or another, one form or another, to reduce your eye pressure is exorbitant. And you basically need to be, because the THC is a very short-lived molecule. In general, it lasts just a couple of hours. So unless you're gonna be smoking or eating or inhaling in some form or another every two, three, four hours to lower the eye pressure, it's not a good idea. Now, the American Glaucoma Society and the American Academy of Ophthalmology recognizes that marijuana has probably at some point a role in the treatment of glaucoma, but it is not there yet. And so the amount that you need to be consuming will be far more detrimental to your overall health than the benefits you'd be gaining from a glaucoma standpoint. So the recommendations are at this point, don't do it for your glaucoma. Don't do it for, uh, for lowering the eye pressure because uh, that's what your friend told you is good. So you should start doing the weed. If you want to do it, I'm not judging. That is a decision that you can make personally, but please don't do it from a glaucoma standpoint. Um, okay, lots of good questions coming through. All right. Um, <laughs> Sharon, I, another really great question. It's completely unrelated to glaucoma, but it, she asked, is there anything one can do to keep from getting floaters? The only thing you can do is to not live. Um, because floaters come with age. It's like gray hairs and wrinkles, cataracts and floaters. Those are all some guarantees on life. And floaters are as a result of some breaking down of gel in the back half of the eye. Again, unrelated to glaucoma, they're usually pretty annoying. Most people, they get used to them. Their brain learns to ignore it. You don't need to worry about it too much. There are some people that can have a tremendous number and they can be really difficult for them to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And if that's the case, there is surgery actually for it. I'm going to share my screen for just a second um, to show you what I'm talking about. So, so the back half of the eye, this kind of big cavity inside the eye is an area called the vitreous. And again, as that it is filled with a gel and as that gel breaks down, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing little pieces of and little shadows being cast by it. So if it is to the point that it's bothering somebody, the solution is... Uh, something called the vitrectomy, again, done by a retina surgeon because it's it basically attached to the retina. They go in there and suck out that gel and that clear, clears out the floaters. Most people don't necessarily recommend it unless it's really bothersome because the risks of surgery may not be, um, may not warrant it. And so again, it's a personal decision and one to have with your retina specialist. Just had that surgery. There you go. So yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a very common surgery. It's the most common surgery the retina specialists do. I definitely do not do vitrectomies. It's outside my area of expertise, but people do it for floaters. Um, you know, 10 years ago, it would be considered malpractice to do that for floaters, but the techniques have gotten so much better. It's so much less invasive, fortunately, now that it's not uncommon for people to have it for floaters, but it doesn't make sense to do it if you're not really bothered by it. It's just you're taking on the risks of surgery and having a vitrectomy is a risk for developing glaucoma, actually. So um, a small risk, but it's nonetheless a risk. So unless it's really bothering you, it doesn't make sense to do so. Dr. Emanuel, we have a uh, Jim has his hand up. So I was going to see if he wanted yeah. to take his question. Go ahead, Jim. Yes, I would uh, written my question in, but uh, and I also have one that I had, uh, sent in earlier. But this one is, uh, I have been on Travitan Z for uh, 10, 12 years, and it's well controlled my pressure. Uh, a visual field test about a year and a half ago indicated some deterioration. So we added Temelol uh, 
in the morning and the evening with the um, uh, Travitan Z in the evening. Wait a minute. No, we had to take all in the morning, kept the Travitan Z in the evening. And right. uh, that seemed to, you know, help that. But my heartbeats per minute dropped down to the low 30s. And uh, so my uh, cardiologist indicated that uh, maybe getting off the Temelol and if, you know, the heart beats per minute would come back up. And they did. They yep. came up to 58. But now my pressure the last two times has, after being 12 over 13, it was 15 over 15. And this last time with my ophthalmologist, it was 21 over 21. Which yes, still sir. is not bad, but it's it's coming up, and yes, I'm wondering sir. if I should try to go back. So, I'm going to try to avoid giving too much personal or individual advice on this because without having reviewed your chart, etc. But Timolol is what's called a beta blocker, um, the, and it's one of the medications that helps decrease flow or uh, decrease fluid into the eye. But one of the side effects, as you mentioned, is that it can lower heart rate. Now in Clinical studies for most people, it usually lowered heart rate by between one and three points, not a significant amount. But in some people, and I had a patient last uh, two weeks ago who had the same issue, that her um, heart rate would drop from in the mid 60s down into the 40s. And so we had her stop it and it went back up. And then I said, hey, well, let's just try just for fun to really make sure it's this medication. And sure enough, she took the, the drop and two days later, heart rate was down in the 40s again. Jim, there are other medications that we can use. I do not think it's in general worth the risk of lowering your heart rate into the 30s, which is incredibly low. That's below even what you know top-notch athletes have. Uh, they're typically into the 40s or 50s, so 30s is pretty on, on the low side. But there are other medications that we have that don't have any effect on heart rate at all. And so I'd probably recommend you speaking to who, um, either your general ophthalmologist or one of our doctors, whomever, about the possibility of trying a different medication if we need to get the pressure lower and not use a beta blocker or not use Timolol to lower the pressure. Jim, you said you had another question. Did you want to ask that? I also have a cat cataract that is getting worse. But uh, Oh, yeah, I saw that it, question earlier. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so one of the things our clinic specializes in probably, again, more than anybody uh, else in the state, maybe even in the country, we love doing combined cataract surgery and glaucoma surgery in the right setting. Um, we absolutely can do both at the same time. There's no reason not to if there's a reason to. And what I mean is if you have a clinically significant cataract, it's affecting the quality of vision. It very much makes sense to do that at the same time. You know, why subject a patient to two surgeries if they can have one? Um, some of the people on this call whose names will go unmentioned have had that done and it can be incredibly successful. So um, that's a great option. Again, it's a discussion for you and Dr. Godfrey um, as far as whether that's the right option for you. Sometimes we prefer to do them separately and we have reasons for that, but it's not uncommon. I mean, I think I have 12 cases next week and probably half of them are going to be combined cataract surgery and a glaucoma surgery. Okay, I, would I know any surgery has risk, and I was just, you know, concerned about doing the two at the same time. My ophthalmologist, who I saw last week, says it's time, and Dr. Godfrey has somewhat indicated that. He said he'd leave it up to me, but he really thought we were approaching that time. Yeah, we don't push. Uh, Godfrey and I especially, I think even more than maybe any of our other doctors, him and I practice very, very similar. We're very similar as far as personalities. We're very similar as the way we practice medicine. Uh, probably because we trained at nearly all the same places. And um, in general, I think most of the doctors in our practice don't push cataract surgery. That's something we want patients to want and need. The only time we'll push it is if we're doing glaucoma surgery at the same time. And so um, it sounds like, Jim, you're on your way towards some surgery a little bit later this year, which is good news for you. Hopefully you'll have notice some pretty good improvement with that. All right. Uh, um, is there any, okay, I'm going to get to a couple more of the these questions that are coming through live. Uh, um, Tina, you're asking a question that I might ask you to clarify. Um, and it's saying, you know, not expecting it to identify a cure for glaucoma today. Yes, unfortunately not. Although it put me out of business, but I'd be okay with that. Uh, but it says, could muscles have a role in eye pressure? And I don't quite know what you mean by that. I don't know if you're referring to the eye muscles having a role in eye pressure. Um, so if Tina, you're on the call. 
you could close that out unless you want to read the queue. If not, I'm going to jump to the next question and wait for you to clarify maybe on another message, okay? Um, okay. Has there been any association between glaucoma and hydrocephalus? Ooh, this is getting kind of detailed. So since normal pressure, hydrocephalus can include increased pressure on the brain and in turn cause excessive pressure on the optic nerve resulting in glaucoma. So I'm going to kind of, uh, this was sent in by Jack. So I'm going to um, take one step back from that and share my screen again and then give you guys a little bit more detail as far as because that's a pretty detailed question maybe outside the realm for this discussion but i will answer in a little bit more general way that i think will help explain so again if we look at our eye model the pressure inside the eye is one factor in glaucoma and, and, and when I refer to glaucoma, I mean on the health of that optic nerve as a result of that pressure. So again, pressure inside here pushing on the optic nerve. That's not the only fluid that has come into contact with the optic nerve. The other is something called cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. And that is fluid that is, lives around the brain, around the spinal cord. It's all continuous and also along the optic nerve. So between this blue and beige area, there would be some fluid, and that would be cerebrospinal fluid. And the how high the pressure is in that fluid certainly plays a role in people developing glaucoma. One of my uh, co-fellows, he was extremely interested in this and is doing a ton of research back at Baskin Palmer in Miami. I'm going to come back off of sharing. Um, and it is just such a hard thing to measure. We know people that have um, high cerebrospinal fluid, it can affect, it doesn't affect the eye pressure directly, but it affects the pressure gradient between the two. So it's kind of a push-pull mechanism happening, right? You're pushing on one side from one pressure and pushing on the other from another pressure, and it's that balance that probably is affecting the optic nerve. The problem is twofold. Number one, it's not easy to measure somebody's CSF pressure, their cerebrospinal fluid pressure. It can be done. It requires a lumbar puncture, putting a needle around the spine to measure that pressure, but it's invasive. It's not easy to measure it. Um, and two, once you have that pressure, there's very little you can do to change it. And so what we as glaucoma doctors tend to do is focus on the things that we can control. So glaucoma is a series of risk factors, pressure being one of those risk factors. So family history is a risk factor, age is a risk factor, race is a risk factor. Pressure is just one of those risk factors. And I always tell people, I can't change how old you are. I can't change whether you're black, white, yellow, green, or whatnot. I can't change your age, but I can change your eye pressure, which is why we treat eye pressure. We can't change your genetics and we ease, uh, just as much can't change your CSF pressure. So we try not to focus on that too much. Now, that being said, for patients with what's called normal pressure glaucoma, we will run some additional tests at times. But again, we unfortunately can't um, change the CSF pressure. So we'd focus, we don't focus on it very much. But great question. Um, yes, Jennifer, the answer to your question is yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm gonna scroll back. I'm gonna try to get, we have a bunch of questions, so I'm gonna try to knock them out pretty quickly so that everybody gets a chance. Um, sweet old Myra, I don't know of any relative that has high pressure glaucoma on either side. Same issue with my husband. What's up with that? Are our three sons in trouble in the future? What is up with that indeed? Because for you and your husband to have no family history and to have found each other, both of whom have glaucoma, you are, you know, two peas in a pod. I mean, having a family history increases your risk of developing glaucoma, but the majority of patients with glaucoma do not have a family history, <clears throat> if that makes sense. So um, there are people where it runs in their family. They're like, you know, my five uncles, my three aunts, my dad, my four sisters, they all have glaucoma. God, their risk of developing glaucoma is dramatically higher. But somebody who says, you know, my long lost great aunt, 
on my father's side, twice removed, had glaucoma, that's not a risk factor. So in general, we consider a first degree relative to be a risk factor, mom, dad, sisters, brothers. But again, most people with glaucoma don't necessarily have a family history. So it's just kind of bad luck that both you and your husband, neither one of you has a family history, but you both ended up with glaucoma. Your sons are at risk of developing glaucoma. They have a higher risk because if there is a genetic component, and we don't know if there is in your case, they have the possibility of receiving those same genes. And so I would definitely recommend that they get checked probably sooner than most and just keep their annual exams. Um, I assume your kids are probably in their 20s or 30s or 40s. And so it would make sense for them to just have their routine eye exams and just keep an eye on this. And their eye doctor, their provider should be aware um, that they have a family history and because again, it increases their risk. Okay. I think Ed wrote a question, will glaucoma produce cloudiness? Um, in general, we talk about glaucoma taking away the quantity of vision, not the quality of vision. So it'll take away, let's for example, again, your peripheral vision, but you might be able to see 2020. It's a little bit of a misrepresentation because yeah, people with glaucoma will say, hey, it's just not, if they have a, let's say one glaucoma is worse than the other, they'll say, hey, this eye with the worst glaucoma is just not quite as good. I know I can see 2020 on the eye chart, but the quality is just not quite as good. And if that's what you mean by cloudiness, then yes, it can absolutely affect that. And of course, at the more severe ends of the spectrum, as that visual field, if it closes off, it can cause severe cloudiness and, and blindness. Uh, one person asked, you know, what's the, basically, what's the best way to do my eye drops? Am I doing them correctly? I have no idea if you're doing them correctly, because I haven't ever seen you do them. But I think that the easiest way to do it is actually uh, pulling the, tilting the head back pulling the lower eyelid down and dropping it just inside the lower eyelid. When you close the eye gently and don't squeeze, but when you close the eye gently, the medication gets all over the eye and absorbed into the eye. Oftentimes doctors recommend close your eye for a minute or two afterward. That helps promote medication going into the eye. Uh, da -da. Margaret asked about what is being done to cure glaucoma? Uh, what, besides the fact that that's the name of our organization, what type of procedure will this be? What are they working on? Um, et cetera. I'm going to tell you the, the, the short answer is that there is no cure for glaucoma currently. And what form that'll take, I have no idea. I think it's going to be some sort of stem cell-like thing, although stem cells themselves are, seem to be really, really tricky. Um, I'm going to put a little plug in for cure glaucoma right now. But in order for us to be able to cure it, we need funding. We need money to be able to do the things that we enjoy doing, the research we enjoy doing. Um, and we are involved in a whole bunch of studies and on a clinical side as part of our practice, but also our nonprofit, Cure Glaucoma, is funding you know, tens of thousands and close to hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in research. But none of that happens without your dollars. I feel like I'm on a telephone right now. But we need your money. Uh, we do, we try to do educational things, but really it's the money that we can use to fund research that we think is worthwhile. Um, and us doctors that are part of GAT are doing all that for free. We don't get paid from Cure Glaucoma to do what we do, but we need that so that we can process samples so that we can hire researchers. We're hoping that one day we'll have our own PhD working for us full time. And with your dollars, you can make that happen. And any donation is always helpful. So Margaret, I expect a big fat check from you soon. Uh, and then last question, it says, I have borderline glaucoma. I use latanoprost at night. My glaucoma doctor says when the time comes, my cataract gets worse, we can do a combined procedure. Um, Anna Maria, I think I kind of talked about that a little bit. So um, <laughs> it says, I'm scared to death to do eye surgery. Uh, you should be scared to have eye surgeries. I mean, someone's going to be cutting on your eye, but that is what we do. Right? I'd be scared to do a whole lot of jobs out there, but that's routine work for us. It doesn't mean that there's not risks and that there aren't complications, but you know, when the time comes, you got to have faith in your doctor that the best is going to happen. And any doctor who tells you they don't have complications is lying or they don't do surgery. We all have risks and complications that we deal with but it's the price of doing business, right? I mean, that's kind of, there's a risk to getting in your car every day and dying in a car accident, but you still get in your car and drive to the mall so you can go shopping at Neiman's, not you, Anne-Marie, but anybody. I mean, we take risks because we need to take risks. 
And again, when the time comes for eye surgery, you should be a little bit scared, but really, you know, again, eye surgery and cataract surgery is the most common surgery in the world by far. And like I said, 3 million of them are done in the United States alone for just cataract surgery, not including all the other things we do. So don't be scared. We'll take care of you. Okay. All right. Let's answer a few. I think that was all that was submitted previously. Dixon, I'm going to touch on your question real quick about beta blockers again. So if you're already on a systemic beta blocker, studies suggest that the topical beta blockers, the ones again that can potentially lower your heart rate, are not as effective, but it's not that they're not effective at all. So a lot of doctors will still try it. I'll see if it works. If it works, great, because it's such a localized area, we might think that getting a higher concentration might be helpful. Um, but oftentimes, if people are already on a systemic beta blocker, it's not as effective. Um, Jim, we already answered this question about the Travitan Z. So Andre is asking about the effects of COVID on uh, glaucoma and the eye in general. And, you know, one of the treatments for COVID right now for those that are in the ICU is to be in a prone position, basically on their stomachs for a large percentage of the day, helps with respiration and things like that, and how that's going to affect a glaucoma, eye pressure, eyes. I swear to you, Audrey, I have no idea. I've seen a bunch of patients that have recovered, but none have been as far to, to my knowledge that were severe cases that were in the ICU or anything. COVID is going to have all, all sorts of effects all, all over the body. Uh, and I think it's probably going to have some sort of effects on the eye, but we may not know those effects for five years or 10 years or maybe even longer. So I think it's going to be mostly a waiting and see kind of a thing. Um, Tina and Steve, I think, are clarifying the muscle eye question. Um, my muscle question related to any muscle that affect eye movement or the eye shape. There are so many muscle systems throughout the body. There are indeed. So there are six eye muscles that control eye movements, and eye pressure is completely unrelated to those in general. There's a couple of rare thyroid conditions and things like that where the muscle bellies can swell and impart some it's not really pushing on the eye directly, but kind of a rare condition. So I'm not going to go too much into it. But in general, muscles and eye pressure are completely unrelated. The only real connection between muscles and glaucoma is what I mentioned earlier as far as us working around the eye muscles during surgery. Uh, but fortunately, they're quite small. We, we know exactly where they are. They're in the same place in every person. Um, and so we're able to avoid them. Susie, does loss of vision in the center of the eye always mean possible macular degeneration? Absolutely not, Susie. Macular degeneration is one of the more common causes of central vision loss. It is by no means the only cause and may not even be the most common. Diabetic eye disease can affect the central vision significantly. Um, things called epiretinal membranes or macular pucklers, all central retinal problems. There are all sorts of genetic diseases that can do it. Cataracts can do it in certain forms and even glaucoma can do it. So we talked about glaucoma usually affecting your peripheral vision. I'd say about five to 10% of people or maybe more, it affects the central vision at a relatively early stage as well. And sometimes only affects the central vision. So no, that is not a uh, quid pro quo to equal um, macular degeneration. That's just a very common cause that we see. And that's why I was mentioning that. <clears throat> All right, we got two more questions and then I think we're gonna cut it off there. Sharon asks, is there anything that I should discuss with the anesthesiologist prior to having surgery with general anesthesia? Um, I'm a little confused. I don't know if you mean from a glaucoma standpoint. So if you're having general anesthesia and you're worried about the effects of it on glaucoma, I wouldn't be. The general anesthetic is usually relatively short term and no real effects on eye pressure that we need to worry about. There are effects. And so if we're ever doing surgery, uh, general anesthesia, or for babies, when we need to take them to the operating room to check eye pressures, because we can't do it in clinic, we actually, right before they have their general sedation, we will check their pressures because we know that uh, IV anesthesia and some of the inhalational uh, anesthesia can affect eye pressure. Oh, not glaucoma surgery. Yes. So uh, thank you. you. should clarify. So yes, for general surgeries and whatnot, no, I wouldn't worry too much about it. They don't need to know anything. And last but not least, Ed is asking, do contacts produce eye pressure? And I think by that you mean uh, kind of contact lenses that you're using for vision rehab or to see better. Yes, no, it's, 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 yeah. 
So scleral lenses, okay, even better. So uh, scleral lenses are a type of contact lens um, that most people are not familiar with, but in general, contact lenses, whether they're scleral lenses or typical contact lenses, soft contact lenses, don't really affect the eye pressure in any sort of way, except that when they're in there, if somebody tries to check your pressure over it, yes, it can affect your pressure. But that's kind of an artificially, it's checking your pressure. You guys have been awesome and asking so many questions and that's really what makes um, this possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you all for joining. We appreciate it.